Picture this. You're floating about in the depths of space, gazing down on our blue marble of a planet. What's on top? You might think it's the North Pole, but that isn't necessarily so. The truth is, our collective belief that the North is at the top of the world doesn't have any solid scientific backing. It's just one of those things we've accepted over time. And this acceptance has a compelling history, with a dash of astrophysics, a bit of psychology, and a surprising twist. It influences how we feel about our world more than we might think. Figuring out where you are is crucial for survival, and that's true for most species, not just us humans. Similar to honeybees, for example, humans have a knack for creating mental maps of our surroundings. But where we really stand out is in our efforts to share these maps with others. We've been at it for a while now, drawing maps on anything from cave walls to computer screens. The earliest ones we found date back to 14,000 years ago. Despite this long history, it's only in the last few centuries that we've decided that the North should consistently be at the top of the map. History buffs tell us that for a long time, the North was hardly ever at the top because it symbolized darkness. The West didn't make the cut either, given that's where the sun bows out each evening. However, early Asian maps seem to defy this trend. Now, before you say it, their compasses weren't the reason they put North at the top. Early Asian compasses were actually aligned to point south, seen as a more favorable direction than the cold, dark north. But in these maps, the emperor, who resided up north, was always placed at the top, with his loyal subjects gazing upwards towards him. Looking back, every culture had its own idea of what was worth looking up to, leading to varied orientations of early maps. The Egyptians preferred the east, where the sun graces us each morning. Early Arabic maps favored the south, European maps from the same era put the East at the top. So, when did everyone decide that North was the new top? You might be tempted to credit it to explorers like Columbus and Magellan who navigated by the North Star, but they didn't really see the world in that light. Columbus, for instance, saw the world with the East at the top, believing he was headed toward paradise. Mercator's 1569 world map was a game changer considering it was the first to factor in the Earth's switch to more accurate navigation. But even then, the emphasis wasn't on the North. Mercator projected the poles to infinity, considering them relatively unimportant as sailors didn't venture there often. It's possible that the choice to place North on top was simply because the Europeans, who were doing their fair share of exploring, were located in the Northern Hemisphere with a whole lot more land to cover and people to meet. For whatever reason, this North Up idea has stuck. Even when a NASA astronaut in 1972 snapped a photo of the Earth with the South at the top, it was flipped over to avoid confusion. Here's where it gets interesting. When you gaze at Earth from space, the concept of up and down loses all sense. Sure, Earth aligns with the plane of other planets in our solar system because we all share a cosmic birth story, but we could just as well flip the image or put the sun on top or bottom depending on your cosmic viewpoint. Even within the Milky Way, our solar system is tilted by about 63 degrees. If you think about it, the concepts of up, down, left, or right don't really apply in space. But how about a change of pace? Should we be open to viewing our world from a different perspective? There's some psychological evidence that our north up mentality might be skewing our perceptions of value. Most folks consider the north to be up and the south down. It even made psychologists wonder if these associations might influence how people value different places on a map. When shown a map of a made-up city, people were more likely to choose a residence in the northern part. And when asked where hypothetical people of different social status would live, they allocated the rich to the north and the less fortunate to the south. It's not too big of a leap to speculate that humans might be less bothered about what happens to regions lower than where they are on the map. But there's a simple solution. Flip the map upside down. These experiments showed that this simple action wiped out the north equals good bias. On that note, south up maps are already available online. Australians would enjoy this change, that's for sure. Whatever it is that you'd prefer at the top of your map, you would need a compass to guide you. Have you ever paused to think of its system? It is one of the oldest gadgets we've got in our survival toolkit. It's been around for centuries, serving as a beacon for adventurers, travelers, and explorers, guiding them through uncharted oceans and helping them discover new continents. Basically, compasses turned humans from stay-at-home types into 
globe-trotting nomads. Our beautiful blue planet isn't just a spinning ball in the cosmos. It also has its own magnetic field. Imagine it as a colossal magnet, humming with invisible energy. This is all thanks to Earth's core, a ball of molten iron under terrific pressure right at the center of our planet. This core, part liquid, part solid crystal, churns and swirls due to Earth's spin, creating the magnetic field that gives us our north and south poles. But here's where it gets a bit complicated. These magnetic poles don't perfectly line up with the Earth's geographic poles, the ones that the Earth spins around. They're close, sure, but not exactly in the same place. This is why the compass, which reacts to magnetic fields, doesn't point directly to what we call true north, which is the geographic north pole. Instead, it points to the magnetic north, located a bit off from the true one. But don't worry, it's close enough to get us where we need to go. Let's talk more about this true north versus magnetic north business. Remember the piece of news from September 2019, when for the first time in over 360 years, compasses at Greenwich pointed to the true north? Well, that's quite a rare occurrence. Usually compasses point towards magnetic north, which isn't a constant spot on the map. It changes and drifts over time, following shifts in the Earth's core. On the other hand, true north refers to the geographic north pole, a specific unchanging point on Earth's surface. So when you're holding a compass, it's really the magnetic north it's directing you toward, not the true north. Here's where things get even more fun. The angle between the direction of the true north and the magnetic north, as shown by the compass, is called declination. It's a fancy word for a simple concept. Now, because Earth's magnetic field isn't a simple, straightforward thing, it has its wobbles and dips. The declination isn't the same everywhere. It varies from place to place. Also, Here's what it's made of. It has this tiny needle that's made from a metal that's been magnetized. Iron's a common one. They set this needle on a little pointy thing, or pivot, and let it float in some kind of liquid, often it's mineral oil or something similar. This lets the needle spin around and dance with the Earth's magnetic field. When you hold your compass flat in your hand, the needle settles down and points to magnetic north. Now, look at your compass and you'll notice these small markings. They're known as degrees, and here's the fun bit. The needle's red end always points north, and the white or black end always points south. That's your compass's north-south dance. Plus, there's often an arrow on the compass case, right at the top. That's your orientation arrow. Now, we all know that all planets are round. There are no square ones so far, and that's because of gravity. Well, roundish, at least, as not all of the planets have perfect proportions. But did you ever wonder about the shape of the universe itself? Is it also round because of the same forces? Well, not really. Based on what information we have so far, the universe is actually… flat? According to the principles of general relativity, space has the ability to curve. This opens the door for the universe to have three potential shapes – a flat plane, like a sheet of paper, a closed sphere, like a bowl, or an open saddle-like curve. This isn't just a matter of academic interest, you know. The universe's shape has direct consequences on its ultimate destiny. One cosmologist from Princeton University explained it beautifully. The shape of the universe is a kind of map to its past and a predictor of its future. The questions of whether the universe will keep expanding forever or collapse at some point, and if it's finite or infinite, all circle back to the question of its shape. Now, To wrap your head around this cosmic question, you need to understand two key elements – the density of the universe and its rate of expansion. Let's dig into this a little. Around 68% of the universe is made up of dark energy, while 27% is dark matter. <laughs> the rest, which is normal matter, if you'd like, makes up the stars, planets, and other cosmic bodies we're familiar with. When we talk about the density of the universe, we're referring to the quantity of normal matter packed into a given volume of space. Now, if the universe is denser, it also has more gravity. In this case, the gravitational pull can overcome the force of expansion. So the universe curls up into a sphere. 
This shape is known as the closed model, where the universe ends up looking like a gigantic cosmic ball. Imagine a world that's finite but without boundaries. A contradiction for sure. In this model, an adventurous explorer could travel forever through space, never bumping into a wall or falling over an edge. Alternatively, if the density of the universe is low and not enough to halt the expansion, then space distorts in the opposite direction. This results in an open universe with negative curvature that resembles a saddle. You know, like on a horse. Despite these two potential scenarios, most scientists agree that the density of the universe is just right. Which means it expands proportionally without curving. But what does it mean if the universe is flat? It doesn't mean we're living in an infinite sheet of paper. To understand it, consider these analogies. Imagine you're in a square room, walk 10 steps to the next corner, make a 90-degree turn, walk another 10 steps, and repeat this process twice more. You end up back at your starting point, completing a square. Add another dimension to this geometry, since we're not 2D creatures, and whoopee, you have a flat universe. This analogy wouldn't hold up in a curved space. If you have a terrestrial globe at home, you might find it easier to understand this next experiment. Start by placing your finger at the Earth's equator, then trace a line to the North Pole, make a 90-degree turn, and return to the equator. Make one more 90-degree turn and walk back to your starting point. This journey only needed three turns, unlike the four turns in the flat universe scenario. Still struggling to understand? Here's another way to picture it. In a flat universe, two rockets traveling side by side will always remain parallel. This is in contrast to a closed universe, where the rockets will travel along the curve of space and eventually meet where they started. In an open universe with negative curvature, the rockets will gradually drift apart and never cross paths again. So is there a cosmological crisis at hand? It seems the answer to the shape of our universe is encoded in the cosmic microwave background, also named CMB, which is like the universe's fossil record. Over the past few decades, scientists have measured temperature fluctuations in the CMB to find almost no curvature, indicating a flat universe. Now, The concept of a flat universe is crucial to the standard cosmological model. However, in late 2019, scientists from a university in Rome published a paper arguing that current CMB measurements actually indicate we're really living in a closed universe. How did they figure this out? Well, they looked at how light behaves in the universe. Specifically, they analyzed how light bends because of the gravitational force of matter in its path. Either way, apart from this finding, there's nothing else that would suggest we're living in a closed universe. Most scientists believe this recent discovery is nothing more than a statistical anomaly. But if the closed universe theory turns out to be right, it would shift decades of astronomical findings. If the universe is indeed curved, it must be so large that the observable 93 billion light years aren't enough to reveal its curvature. It could be similar to standing in a fog, only able to see a small flat patch of land. Yet somewhere out of sight, the horizon reveals that we live on a sphere. As we continue to probe the cosmos, we might find that the apparent flatness of our universe is just a small part of a much larger, curved cosmos. Its shape is just one of the many things we've yet to figure out about the universe. We can't quite put our finger on why the universe is even here, for instance. We do have some theories, but scientists are yet to be sure. It could be that the universe is like a pop-up, materializing out of an unstable nowhere land. Imagine the emptiest emptiness you can think of, suddenly churning out matter and energy in equal and opposite amounts that tally up to zero. For most of us, it's hard to picture that process. If we follow this theory, who's to say there's only one universe? We might be just one of an enormous collection, a so-called multiverse. For now, we'll just have to wait for the next wave of cosmic measurements to refine our theories. 
and for scientists to come up with hypotheses that aren't just mathematically pretty, but actually testable. Also, how could we possibly know all the secrets of the universe if we don't completely understand our own biology yet? I mean, if we did, we could, theoretically, solve all of our health problems, right? We might even be able to play around with our DNA, like this molecular Lego, and give ourselves naturally purple hair or red fingernails. Well, time for a reality check, as we're still struggling with this one too. Here's a great example, our microbiome. Our bodies, home to 10 trillion human cells, are also an active city for 100 trillion microbial cells. That's a couple of pounds of bacteria and other microbes, which we absolutely can't do without. They've set up shop in our bellies, lungs, noses, and every other hidden nook and cranny. We're like luxurious cruise ships for these tiny microbial tourists, and we still don't fully understand the implications of this symbiotic relationship. There are still a lot of things we don't know about planet Earth, either. We've only ever dipped our toes into Earth's crust, never venturing more than a few miles deep. Everything else is our best guess, from remote sensing and smart physics. Believe it or not, it took us an embarrassingly long time to accept that the Earth's crust is constantly shifting, like Jenga pieces. We only warmed up to plate tectonics in the mid-20th century. We're also still trying to figure out precisely how the planet's inner engine works, and how the swirling, conducting materials in the outer core create our protective magnetic field. Plus, with 4.5 billion years of geological chaos, we're sometimes better off studying meteorites or the surfaces of other celestial bodies for clues about our planet's history. Even our faithful companion, the Moon, is a bit of a mystery. Was it born from a colossal collision or some other event? We're still not sure. But hey, the fact that we still have a lot to learn is what makes life interesting, isn't it? That, and the thrill of actually finding an empty parking spot in San Francisco. Or maybe even your city. Black holes tearing apart enormous stars. Pulsars spinning at incredible speeds and emitting powerful beams of energy. Colorful nebulae with fireworks of newborn stars. Galaxies of every possible color and size. All of these are found within our universe. But it's not infinite. It has a boundary, a literal wall. And beyond that, there's an absolute nothingness. Right now, we're going to make a journey to that wall. But first things first, our universe is like a humongous nesting doll. If you open it up, there's a smaller one inside. It's a galaxy. Inside that is an even smaller doll. That's our solar system. And the smallest doll of all is the Earth. Each of these dolls has boundaries that we are going to cross. For that, we'll need a spaceship and a big one. It also has to be able to move a hundred times faster than the speed of light. You get on board and start the engines. 62 miles above sea level is our first boundary. That's 10 times higher than passenger planes fly. This point is called the Kármán line. It separates the atmosphere of the Earth from outer space. Now we fly further to the edge of our solar system. We turn on the hyperdrives and fly past Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. We've traveled a distance of 100 astronomical units. One AU is the distance from Earth to the Sun. And here's the boundary of our solar system, the heliosphere. Here, the speed of the solar wind decreases rapidly. First, it drops from 620,000 miles per hour to the speed of sound. Then, there's a layer called the heliopause. This is where the wind almost vanishes. And then, our ship experiences a bow wave. This is where we feel the force of the interstellar wind, which collides with the boundary of our solar system. When you pass this boundary, you find yourself in the dark of interstellar space. And here, you can find two human-made objects that made this trip for the first time in history. They're Voyager 1 and Voyager 2. Voyager 1 crossed that boundary in 2004. Voyager 2 did it in 2007. These space probes discovered that the heliosphere is not a perfect ball around the sun. Its southern boundary is 10 AUs closer to the star than the northern one. So, 
we're moving in interstellar space and will soon approach a stone wall around our solar system. 200,000 AUs further, and there it is. This wall of rock is the Oort cloud. In fact, it's a pile of asteroids that surround our world. Scientists speculate that the Oort cloud could be the source of comets and meteorites that fall to Earth, but they're so sparse that we easily fly between them. Now we're in complete darkness. The Milky Way is about 106,000 light years wide. In a conventional rocket, it would take billions of years to fly across that distance. But you throttle to the max. You masterfully fly past the stars and planets as if on a racetrack. And within minutes, you're at the edge of our galaxy. There's no more interstellar wind. All you see are bright dots somewhere in the distance. These dots are huge galaxies. We need to look at a map to make a route to the edge of our entire universe. You're here, near the Milky Way galaxy. It's part of a cluster of galaxies called the Linnea Caea Supercluster. But even this huge thing is like a little street in a big city. Zooming out, we find Hydra Centaurus Supercluster. Thousands of galaxies on the map look like little dots. Maximum zoom out! This is our entire observable universe. We thought it was infinite, but we may have proof that it has a boundary. It's here, 10 billion light years away from our home. Even if you travel at the speed of light, a trip there would take twice as long as our whole planet has existed. During that time, the sun will either fade away or explode like a supernova, destroying our entire solar system. And if you can live that long and then return home, you will see that our galaxy is there no more. It's long since collided with the Andromeda galaxy and merged into one big cosmic body. Luckily, your ship is able to warp space-time so that this journey will literally take a few seconds. Boom! Congratulations! You've arrived at your destination, the Eridanus Supervoid. Some scientists believe this location is the evidence of collisions of our universe with something big enough to leave such a large scar. The Eridanus Supervoid is an empty and cold space one billion light years wide. If you think of this void as a cup, it would fit at least 10,000 galaxies, and it appeared after an accident of gigantic proportions. The object that crashed into our universe was… another universe! Yes, other universes may actually exist. Imagine that our entire universe is a huge bubble that contains all the clusters of galaxies in the observable universe. There could be an infinite number of such bubbles. They could have been born during the Big Bang. These universes may be different from ours. They may have other galaxies and nebulae. But these bubbles could also be parallel universes. This means that if you chose cereal over oatmeal in the morning, in another universe, your twin would choose the oatmeal. Every choice you ever made in life had completely different consequences in a parallel universe. And because the number of choices are infinite, there's a whole infinity of parallel universes. So, like a regular bubble, our universe has a wall that is near the Eridanus supervoid. Long ago, another bubble flew past ours. As they approached each other, their gravitational fields began to interact. Our boundary wall began to deform and pull toward the other universe. The same thing happened on the other side. Then the walls of our universes came into contact. But as these bubbles moved, their connection began to break. And the other universe just ripped a huge chunk of ours. A cold void was formed at the point of collision, and that was the Eridanus supervoid. The problem is that the universe looks the same to the observer, regardless of point of view. For example, imagine a basketball hanging in the air. Now if we put an ant on the ball and tell it to find the edge of the ball, it will start running around it, making an infinite number of circles. But the landscape around the ant will not change. All it will see is a rounded horizon. That's because the ball remains the same from any point of view. The same thing happens to us when we try to find the edge of our universe. All because we imagine the world in three-dimensional space, and our view is limited. For example, you see an ordinary square in two-dimensional space. But if you add depth and change the point of view, voila, it's a cube. If we could see the universe in four-dimensional space, a square might be something completely different. But maybe we can leave our home bubble. The key to traveling to another universe might be inside a black hole. A black hole is one of the most mysterious objects in the universe. They're so heavy, they warp not only space, but time as well. It's like putting a heavy boulder on a net. The net will sag, 
and the closer you get to the boulder, the stronger the curvature is. Once you're in the gravitational field of a black hole, you can't leave it. We still don't know what might actually be in the heart of a black hole. Some scientists speculate that white holes also exist. Theoretically, they should be born along with black holes. Except for the color, they're the exact opposite of black holes. Nothing can come close to a white hole. At the moment, there's no data on such objects, but general relativity theory suggests they do exist. There's also a theory that a black hole may be a passage to another universe. When you get into a black hole, you can come out the other side through the event horizon of the white hole. So you bypass the boundary of the universes and find yourself in a completely different world. But we may have proof that a white hole exists. In 2006, scientists discovered an unusual burst of energy somewhere 1.6 billion light years away from Earth. This burst was unique. It didn't look like a supernova explosion or even the merger of two black holes. Some astronomers believe it was the birth of a white hole. But because it was unstable, it was destroyed almost immediately. This process was reminiscent of the birth of our entire universe, the Big Bang. So, scientists called it the Little Bang. This is our home planet Earth and its satellite, the Moon. Zooming out, and here's our solar system. A bit more, the Milky Way galaxy. And we're a small dot among an infinite number of stars. Now, even farther out, a cluster of galaxies. Dots and swirls in the endless space. Further, there's Laniakea, supercluster. That little dot here is our galaxy. Moving on, Hydra Centaurus supercluster. Huge clusters comprising thousands of galaxies are no more than a speck from here. Next, Pavo Indu supercluster. This is an area 200 million light years wide. We can zoom out until we see the entire observable universe. Each little dot in here actually contains thousands of galaxies and quadrillion stars. Scientists speculate that our universe may look like a bubble, and that bubble might collide with another universe. Yes, other universes could exist. Actually, even a whole infinite number of those. All of them could have appeared after the Big Bang. The collision between them isn't impossible either. At least, it might have happened before. And the proof is here, in the direction of the constellation Eurydinus. This place is called Eurydinus Supervoid. It's about 1 billion light years wide. By comparison, the width of our entire galaxy is only about 100,000 light years. There's absolutely nothing in this place, and it may be a trace from an old collision between our universe and another. Scientists think they were passing by each other. When the distance between them was minimal, the gravitational forces of the bubbles began to pull toward each other, just like two drops of water trying to connect when they're close. But the speed of the universes was too high for them to continue interacting. So the other universe just tore out a piece of our bubble. There might have been about 10,000 galaxies in that void, and all of them were either destroyed or taken over by the other universe. Let's travel to the edge of our universe to see how this collision might have taken place. We're 10 billion light years away from our home. Here, in another galaxy, we see amazing nebulae of different colors and shapes. And if you look in the other direction, there's a huge wall moving at us. All these bright sparks on it are enormous galaxies about to collide with us. But in fact, it's a humongous mirror that only reflects our universe. Here, space-time is distorted and begins to be pulled into another universe at a tremendous speed. The usual law of physics may simply stop working at this point. Gravity may disappear, and with it, all the stars would explode and people on the surface of planets would hang in weightlessness. But if the universes didn't go at a tangent but crashed directly into each other, things would be much scarier. The enormous amount of collision energy would probably cause an incredible explosion. Its force would simply destroy everything in our bubbles. Still, the two bubbles might begin to merge, too. At first, all galaxies at the edge of the universes would be torn apart. But then, the merger would begin. The galaxies would start moving chaotically. They would fly past each other, break apart, collide, and explode. The collision of two galaxies is an accident of enormous proportions. And it might happen to our home quite soon, in space terms. The Andromeda galaxy is heading our way. It's a spiral galaxy about twice the size of ours. And there are about a trillion stars there, which is twice more than in our Milky Way. 
At the very center of this bright galaxy lurks a dark beast, a black hole. Its weight is 2 and 8 zeros of the sun's mass. Red giants, hundreds of times larger than our sun. Pulsars emitting enormous amount of energy like spotlights. Rogue stars and many large and small black holes. This soup of dangerous objects is moving toward us at 68 miles per second. A trip to New York to Los Angeles at that speed would only take half a minute. The disk of Andromeda can already be seen with the unaided eye on moonless nights. As time goes on, it'll get even bigger. As Andromeda gets closer to us, its gravitational force will begin to stretch the arms of our spiral galaxy. It'll begin to unwind. The stars and planets will lose their orbits. One possible scenario is that an unknown asteroid, or even a dwarf planet from the Andromeda galaxy, will crash into the Earth at an incredible speed. Our planet will explode just like a balloon from this impact. Oh, goody. Another option involves stellar collisions. Our Sun would face another star. The bigger star will slowly begin to consume the smaller one. First, it will steal the light upper layers from it, and then it will eat it just like spaghetti or even like rigatoni. When a large star reaches its critical weight, it will burst. This explosion will destroy everything around it, including our solar system. Perhaps the shockwave will even reach other neighboring stars. Yet another scenario is that our solar system will be thrown into dark space. Imagine a tennis ball tied to a rope. You take the rope and spin the ball over your head like a sling. Then you let go of the rope and send the ball flying. This is what will happen to the Sun and all the planets around it. We'll find ourselves in dark and cold space. But life on Earth will not be affected. We'll still have our bright star to keep us warm. The only disadvantage is that all the stars in our night sky will disappear. And the most likely possibility is that the merger of two giant galaxies will have no effect on us at all. The thing is, the distance between stars and planets in space is enormous. So they can all just mix together and form one giant cloud. It would be like shoveling fine sand through a big sieve. The objects won't interact with each other. But the most interesting thing will happen to the black holes in the centers of our galaxies. Right now, there's a dense cluster of stardust and stars around them. As Andromeda and the Milky Way come closer together, they will begin to dance with each other. Gee, will it be the twist or the foxtrot? And when the black holes get close together, they'll begin to swallow all matter around one another. Billions of tons of colored stardust, asteroids, and star particles will fly toward the very center of either black hole. It might seem like this process happens very slowly, but it's an illusion. Super heavy objects like black holes warp the space-time grid, so time is much slower near black holes. And all objects that seemingly stay on the event horizon for weeks or even months are actually long gone. When the black holes finally come together, they merge into one supergiant black hole. But its mass is slightly less than the combined mass of the two dark monsters. Some of their weight is transformed into collision energy. This energy is released so strongly that its waves can be felt in other galaxies. Now, a huge black hole gathers all this dense and hot core of the two galaxies around itself. At some point, the black hole feels full and throws out powerful jets of energy into space. This is called an active galactic nucleus. It's one of the brightest phenomenon in the universe and the most powerful source of electromagnetic radiation ever known. These jets may be more than 5,000 light years long. By comparison, the distance from Earth to the nearest star, Proxima Centauri, is only 4.2 light years. And the explosion that accompanies the jets has the power of 100 supernova explosions. Wow, blows my mind. The blast wave from this event could even reach the edges of a new galaxy. And this outburst would be visible from millions of light years away. Now, there are dense clouds of multicolored dust at the center of merged galaxies. The weight of these clouds is so great that they begin to shrink and take on a round shape. Gradually, they become so heavy that they compress the core and nuclear reactions start inside them. The temperature begins to rise and soon, boom, there's a supernova. It's a veritable fireworks show at the center of the galaxies. Stars erupt from the fog and form new hot worlds. At this point, the arms of the two galaxies that were previously pulled out slowly return to their former shape. 
The super heavy center of our galaxy has such a gravitational force that it affects stars and nebula hundreds of thousands of light years away. The galaxy's arms twist again, and we see the new and finished galaxy, the Milkomeda, or Milkdromeda. Hey, how about the Andro Milky Meda way? Blah blah blah. Well, that's hard to say. Empty space is not really empty. At least, that's what quantum field theory says. It's actually filled with tiny vibrations that can turn into virtual particles if they have enough energy. These virtual particles can produce packets of light with low energy called photons. Now, there's something every black hole has. An event horizon. It's a point of no return. That means once something crosses that point, it can never get away. Not even light. And there's an insanely strong gravitational force around the event horizon. Black holes survive by gobbling up gas and stars around them. In most cases, a black hole has a swirling disk of material that surrounds it, called an accretion disk. It glows brightly as all those things that come too close to an event horizon get heated up and torn apart before the black hole swallows them all. As material comes closer, it starts to travel and move faster and faster, going all around the black hole. This makes the accretion disk glow and, at the same time, outlines the shadow of the black hole, which is basically the very event horizon we're talking about. Black holes might even want to hide, but they do so awfully badly. According to Einstein's theory of general relativity, gravity bends and warps space and time. It means that the closer you come to this extremely powerful gravitational pull around the black hole, the more twisted space and time around it become. That's what Stephen Hawking was talking about nearly 50 years ago, and it doesn't stop there. He also suggested that if these particles find a way to escape a black hole, they steal some of its energy. And because of these thieves, the black hole loses its energy as time goes by until it, at one point, completely disappears. He suggested that black holes release energy in the form of thermal energy or heat, which is called Hawking radiation. And this radiation doesn't carry any information. It means that when a black hole evaporates, it destroys all information it had about the star that created the black hole. That way, we can't know what really happened. And it's kind of confusing because the laws of quantum mechanics say the information can't be destroyed. This conflict is something we call the Hawking information paradox. According to Hawking, all this information isn't really lost, but is stored in a cloud of all those zero energy particles that surround the black hole. He called that soft hair. Now, there's this new study as a possible solution to this paradox. Maybe Hawking radiation is non-thermal. Instead of just releasing plain heat, it's possible the black hole sends out a message in the form of radiation. This message contains important information about the black hole's past, the stars that formed it, and other details we thought were lost forever. It's like a secret code that tells us all about the history of the black hole. But let's go back to Hawking's theory, where a black hole can eventually disappear. It says that not only black holes produce Hawking radiation, any object with enough mass can. Researchers actually studied a process called the Schwinger effect too. It's when an electromagnetic field creates strong distortions and in that way forms matter. They applied this idea to Hawking's theory of black hole radiation. What they found is that the radiation Hawking predicted can actually be created in places with different levels of gravity, not just around black holes. Here's the key. When there are massive objects, like stars or planets, they create a curving effect on space and time. This curving is there because of their strong gravity. Even if you're far away from a black hole, there's still some massive object somewhere around that creates the curving of space, which can make you feel like you're in that twisted space. It can create radiation, similar to what happens near black holes. It means that not only black holes can slowly evaporate, other massive objects in the universe can also lose their energy in the same way. If this is true, the energy of everything in the universe will slowly be drained away in the form of light particles. That means everything and everyone, including stars, planets, black holes, and us, share the same destiny, 
and will all eventually fade away. This sounds scary at first, but even if this theory is true, it's not going to happen anytime soon. It would take way longer than the current age of the universe for a supermassive black hole to completely disappear. So, in the way we measure time, black holes are basically eternal. And stars could last even longer since many black holes formed after some giant star collapsed upon itself. Some others belong to a group called primordial black holes. Hawking, who became famous for talking about black holes, mentioned those ones as well. And the theory says they probably formed spontaneously in the early universe, not long after the Big Bang happened. Hawking realized that primordial black holes could have different sizes, from very light to very heavy. Really small ones would have disappeared by now because of Hawking radiation. There's a pretty cool idea that these primordial black holes could be dark matter. It's a mysterious substance that scientists think exists in the universe. It doesn't give off or reflect light, so we can't see it directly. Scientists think dark matter might explain why stars and galaxies move in strange ways, but we still don't have the tools yet to confirm whether these black holes really exist or if they're actually made up of dark matter or not. Hawking also explored the idea that our universe is just one of many universes. It's a concept called the multiverse. Some scientists believe it could be that any situation you can imagine in your life is happening somewhere in some other universe. Hawking didn't agree with that, so in his final paper, he proposed a new mathematical framework that made the multiverse finite instead of infinite. This means that there would be a limited number of universes rather than an infinite number. Another thing that's hard to test and prove, but at least he left us with something to think about. Believe it or not, time travel is not that impossible according to the laws of physics. Scientists have equations that suggest we could have something called closed time-like curves that might allow us to go back in time. Imagine going back to the most embarrassing moments of your life. Knowing what would happen, you could avoid them. But here's the tricky part. Going back in time could cause some big problems. It could create situations where things would happen in a way that doesn't make sense. Imagine you're walking down the street and meeting your younger or older self or accidentally changing things that have already happened. Hawking was talking about this part too, and these are all things that made him concerned about time travel. He made a guess called the chronology protection conjecture. He suggested there might be a rule of nature that stops time travel from happening because it could create all these strange and confusing situations where we would just go back, fixing our wrong decisions rather than living in the present. Until we discover traveling through time without causing such disruptions, I guess all we're left with are life lessons and learning from our mistakes. In his last years, Hawking talked about the future of humanity and we still don't know if he was totally serious. He mentioned a special particle called the Higgs boson that could cause a big bubble that could gobble up and eventually even destroy the universe. He also mentioned things like beings from other planets coming to Earth and conquering us, or robots becoming smart enough to take over the world. Some of his ideas turned out to be true, and time will tell if it will be the same with the others. Space. Dark, lifeless, and quiet, right? Well, apparently, it's not always true. Recently, scientists have detected an eerie echo coming from the main black hole in our galaxy. It has high and low notes and sounds pretty otherworldly. What does it mean? Should we sound the alarm bell, siren, whatever? Sagittarius A star is our own supermassive black hole, sitting right in the center of the Milky Way galaxy where we live. You might know that black holes are the true monsters of our universe, gobbling up everything that is careless enough to come too close. If a massive black star runs out of its star fuel, it sometimes becomes super dense and buckles under its own weight, collapsing inward and bringing space-time along. As a result, the gravitational field of this new thing becomes so strong that nothing can escape it, not even light. And so goes a black hole. We really can't see black holes since they devour everything, even light. But we can still figure out where they're located, all thanks to the existence of accretion disks. Want an explanation? Well, picture a black hole. 
The starving thing consumes all the matter that strays too close, squeezing it into a superheated disk of glowing gas. The black hole also bends light around it, which creates a circular shadow. That's what I mean. We can't see a black hole itself, but we can see the accretion disk surrounding it. It happens like this. First, the material gets caught in the black hole's orbit and squeezed into a razor-thin spinning band. Friction, heat, electric, and magnetic forces energize this disk, which makes the material glow intensely. The most massive black holes have such bright bands that they can outshine millions of galaxies. Inside this disk of glowing material, particles rub against one another. It slows them down and sends them straight toward the black hole's event horizon. If this friction didn't exist, the material would be orbiting the black hole for billions of years, like planets circling around their stars. Now, let's get back to Sagittarius A star. It's far less luminous than other black holes at the center of galaxies astronomers have observed. It means that, at the moment, our central black hole isn't actively munching on the matter surrounding it. What, is it catching some Zs? The answer is unclear. There's new evidence received by NASA's IXP telescope. It suggests that the seemingly sleeping giant woke up pretty recently, about 200 years ago. Ooh, that is recent. It snacked on gas and all kinds of cosmic debris within its reach. Why did it happen? And what did the black hole do after that? Sagittarius A star is the nearest to a supermassive black hole, just 25,000 light years away from Earth. Its estimated mass is millions of times greater than that of our Sun. It sounds impressive, doesn't it? So, when scientists spotted relatively recent X-ray emissions of ginormous clouds of gas in the vicinity of the black hole, they immediately called on the IXP telescope to figure out what it may mean. What intrigued them most was how bright these clouds were. You see, most cosmic clouds, called molecular clouds, are dark and cold, with their X-ray signatures very faint. But that wasn't the case with this finding. Of course, there are a few theories concerning this phenomenon. One of the main explanations for why these giant molecular clouds are shining so bright is that they just echo a long-gone flash of X-ray light. It could mean that our supermassive black hole might not have been that dormant some centuries ago. After additional research, astronomers figured out that the X-rays coming from the giant molecular clouds were actually reflected light. And this light must have come from a short-lived and extremely intense flare that was produced either very near or right at Sagittarius A star. And the most likely cause of it is the black hole suddenly consuming a huge chunk of the material surrounding it. It happened around the start of the 19th century. It was most likely a sight to behold. Whirlpools of particles were drawn toward the black hole's event horizon, also known as the point of no return. The black hole started to ingest all this material, which resulted in brilliant bursts of X-ray light and echoes that we managed to translate into sound waves here on Earth. This discovery is crucial for understanding the processes happening to and around our supermassive black hole. We might also figure out what physical processes can potentially awake Sagittarius A star again, even if this period of activity is just temporary. Supermassive black holes are the largest among all black holes out there. Their mass can be hundreds of thousands or even millions to billions of times the mass of our Sun. And two such giants have been recently spotted with the help of the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array of Telescopes, mercifully also known as ALMA. Two gigantic black holes were growing alongside each other not far from the center of the coalescing galaxy. Apparently, these black holes came across each other when their host galaxies collided. One of the black holes is around 200 million times the mass of our Sun, and the other is a bit smaller – about 125 million times the mass of our star. They aren't visible directly, but are surrounded by bright clusters of warm glowing gas and stars tucked close by the black hole's gravitational pull. Time will pass, and these black holes will start circling each other. And eventually, they will collide, creating one, probably even bigger, black hole. Interestingly, such immense merges are more typical for distant galaxies. This makes it harder for Earth-based telescopes to see them. But the sensitivity of ALMA helped astronomers observe these bright and compact regions 
where matter swirls around black holes. Imagine how surprised they were when, instead of one black hole, they saw two of them munching on the dust and gas stirred up by the massive space merger. And if before, experts thought that such galaxy mergers didn't really happen in our neighborhood, this discovery may mean that black hole binaries like this one may be much more common than we previously thought. And if pairs of black holes are so common, it can make it easier for us to study gravitational waves. These waves, also known as ripples in space-time, occur when black holes collide. If we talk about the recently discovered pair of black holes, it might still take them several hundred million years to crash into each other. But by observing their behavior, scientists can figure out how many binary black holes that are about to collide there are in the universe. Also, this may give us more insight into what is going to happen when our home Milky Way galaxy collides with the Andromeda galaxy in about 4.5 billion years. Oh, I can't wait. Now, have you heard that we might be living in a black hole? No, I'm not kidding. Such a scary theory does exist. See for yourself, black holes pull inside everything they see. But what if one black hole has already engulfed us long ago? Surprisingly, some physicists deem this theory somewhat plausible. For example, Dr. Nikodem Poplovsky, a theoretical physicist from Indiana University, states that everything that a black hole swallows may turn into a new universe inside the hole or on the other side of it. Who knows? Maybe our universe used to be a quite different place until it got pulled into a black hole. The theory of white holes is closely connected with the previous idea. While black holes swallow all the matter so that not even light can escape, white holes are something quite the opposite. These formations are believed to spit out everything that black holes have pulled in. In other words, a white hole is the hypothetical area of space-time that nothing can enter from the outside, but light and matter can escape from it. As for a black hole, on the contrary, you can only enter it from the outside but can't get free afterward. 